All right, well, my name is Rain Hendricks. I am here to talk to you today about unfactoring from patterns. Um, before we get started, I'd like to give you a brief uh, look at what some people have been saying about uh, unfactoring. For instance, uh, Jason Seifer, you may know from Rails Envy. <laughs> also, Jason Seifer from Rails Envy. And once again. <laughs> Yosef Mendelssohn. <laughs> and Rick Bradley. <laughs> so how many of you are familiar with Sturgeon's Law? A few of you. Sturgeon's Law says that 90% of everything is crap. <laughs> There's a corollary to that law. There is the Susser corollary. <laughs> and there is the Henrik's corollary to the Susser corollary. In other words, so my talk today is basically about the fact that you, uh, you all suck at ruby.com. <laughs> really, really. I'm not just making that up. And this raises an important question. How secure are your jobs when you think about it? Because studies show a strong correlation between the maintainability of code and the expendability of its author. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, which studies show that? And the answer is shut up. <laughs> now, now, some of you may not be good with words either, so we're going to try a little graph. <laughs> it's OK. You don't have to panic. Just embrace the failure and use it to your advantage by unfactoring. Now, I'm sure some of you are wondering, what is unfactoring? It's actually very simple. Unfactoring is the process of taking well-designed software and through an iterative series of small changes, making it completely unmaintainable by anyone but you. So now, how do I go about unfactoring my code? Well, what kind of systems do we need to unfactor? The things we're looking for are simple systems, code that communicates well and that is flexible, code that is ultimately maintainability is the, is the watchword here. We're trying to avoid maintainable systems. Because if your system is maintainable, that means anyone can maintain it, not just you. And so all of that is bad. We're, all trying, we're trying to avoid these things. Um, and so what are some examples of uh, some code smells or code perfumes, as I prefer to call them, uh, that you can look for in your code, well, we're looking for things like small methods that do one simple thing. We're looking for small classes, simple classes that have one goal, one purpose, that don't mix a lot of different concerns in the same place. We're looking for dry code. We're looking for things that have intention of reeling names. All of that is super bad, and it's going to make your code far too easy to maintain. So now that I've found some code to unfactor, what do I do to unfactor that code to make it less maintainable? First of all, you should be testing all the time. <laughs> And now, I know some of you might be thinking, if I'm trying to make code less maintainable, why would I write tests? Well, stop, stop, stop thinking that. Just, just listen. You're writing tests so you can unfactor your code into something that no one can maintain, but that you know still works. Because it still has to work, right? If it doesn't work, you're just going to get fired anyway, because then you're incompetent. So your code still has to you, Look, you can delete the tests when you're done. I don't care. Just write tests while you're doing this, OK? Write tests while you're doing this. Unfactor your code. We'll go over some examples. And then when you're done and your code's unmaintainable and your job is secure, you can delete the tests. Don't commit them because then people can find them. <laughs> uh, so once you have tests that cover the code you're going to unfactor, you want to start by making small changes. Now, unfactoring can be difficult work. You're going to be taking something that's easy to understand, and you're going to be making it much harder to understand. And it can be difficult to keep all of that in your head at the same time. So you want to go slowly. You, you don't want to tie yourself out in one big bang. Um, so <laughs> what kind of changes are we going to be making here? Well, one of the easiest ones is to complexify. We're going to be using confusing logic and avoiding patterns and idioms that other people can understand. It's good to use obscure Ruby tricks like the double bang. Does anyone know what that means? <laughs> Any of you guys know what the double bang trick is? Excellent. You shouldn't use that. Good. Good. Okay. 
You're going to want to dampen your code as well. Now, a lot of you have heard about dry, and so that's the first thing to look for. You want to look for duplicate code that's been dried up into one place and then unfactor that back out into a lot of different places. But not only do you duplicate the code, you should make a lot of small changes each time you duplicate the code. <laughs> you know, maybe use different variable names each time, just to make it harder to, to factor again. Uh, the last thing you're going to want to do once you have all of this done is to obfuscate your code. I prefer Pig Latin <laughs> for this task. Uh, I find it works very well. And so I think now the best thing to do um, would be to show some illustrative case studies because you have to have those in a talk like this. I understand. So here's an example from uh, Capistrano. Now I, I hope you can all read that. Basically it's the deploy task from Capistrano that you would use if you're deploying using a cached strategy. And what it does is it updates the, the cache uh, of the repository on the server you're deploying to and then it copies that repository cache into the deploy location. That makes sense, right? Uh, you can pretty much read that and see what it's doing. You don't necessarily have to go look at those other methods. You just assume they do what it says on the box and the method works. So that's what we want to avoid. We want to fix that by co complexifying, unfactoring, taking this nice composed method pattern and breaking those out into each of the uh, inline code that those methods represent. So that's the first step. Now, if, if you probably can't read that, and, and that's, it's, that's fine. It's, it's mostly so that you can just get a sense of the scope of the code. Um, but there are some things in there that have been dried. There's a run command that's been duplicated. So we want to take that out, and we want to, um, you know, just <laughs> obfuscate that code a little bit by just putting it all in line. And then you can, you can go in there and you can change some variable names if you want. And then finally, we can take that same code and obfuscate it with pig Latin. <laughs> And when you put all of that together, you can go from this pretty factored, easy to read and maintain code that's going to get you fired to something more like this. <laughs> so that, so that, as an example, this is uh, the goal. This is what we're shooting for here. So the more your code looks like this and the less your code looks like this, the better you're doing. Just keep that in mind. Uh, as another example here, this is a webby task. This is initializing a webby site. It does some pretty simple things. Again, it uses a nice composed method pattern here. The methods have intention revealing names. So it's easy to scan this and understand what this method does when it's run. And we would be able to unfactor this using the same uh, process to have it look something more like this. And uh, so one of the things I wanted to do is, uh, how many of you remember the 15 minute blog video, <coughs> the Rails 15 minute blog Oops. video? I thought I would do a 10 minute Ogblay video, or actually a live demo, which can be uh, scary, but we're going to try it here. I'm going to try a little bit of this. So, give me just a second. Okay. So what I've done is I've uh, forked Rails and I've uh, added some pig Latin to it. So I'm going to go ahead and ales ray create a ogblay here. <laughs> now one of the things I have to do here is I have to copy in the, the fork Rails because I didn't really feel like building a gym because that would be too maintainable. So I'm just going to copy in my ales ray code into vendor. I'll take a second because my machine is about to die. There we go. All right, now we've got the basic Rails structure. I believe this is the point where he does something like uh, lists out the files that it's created and goes, whoops, look, we have helpers, right? That's, that's nice. So what we want to do here is just create, you know, a very basic blog. So we can start by generating a controller, call it Ogblay. Now, if I remember correctly, we have an index here. <laughs> Uh, 
And so then we do this and we start the server. So, oh, here we are at our Rails welcome page. Whoops. And then we can look at our Ogblay. Whoops. <laughs> And uh, Elohe Worldway. So that's how easy it is to get to Elohe Worldway with unfactored rails. I thought I'd get more applause on that one. <laughs> <sighs> Thanks. <laughs> so, so what we want to do now is we want to see how easy it is to create views because we want to be more MVC about this. So let's create an R a view file here. And let's say hello from the emplet Tay. Let's go back and take a look. And here we have hello from the emplet Tay. So there's Rails. Or Ails Ray, possibly. But that's not really a lot of stuff. We really want to have some posts. And the restful way to have posts would to have would be to have an OSPAYS controller, right? So let's go ahead and scaffold an OST pay controller. Let's see, what, did this, what does this need? It needs an idle tay <laughs> and an Audi bay. So we generate that, and once that's done, whoops, Rails just writes all of this stuff for us. We've got OST pay here, IND pay all. <laughs> And you can see if you just go to this new OSPAY controller, whoops, we have to run our migrations. So we run our migrations and we can reload the page and now we're listing OSPAYs. Let's create an OSPAY. So you see Rails automatically gives you these text fields here because it's, it's, it knows how you generated the scaffold. It can read the columns in the database because it's a ninja. And then you can say, hello, hey, Orlando way. Create a post. Whoops, we have a post. <laughs> or oast pay, as I like to call it. So now, one of the things that you'll see if you look at this index file here is that it's, it's, not, it's not as pretty if we go back to look at how it looks in the HTML. It's using a table, and we don't like tables. So I think he went in and fix some stuff here, and fix some stuff here, get rid of some stuff here, get rid of that there, get rid of that there, and it looks more like that there. We can add another post. Hello again. So we're listing some posts here. We can see the index. <laughs> Looks pretty good. Let's make that an H2 because that's what it should be. So now we've got some posts. We've got a basic blog here. It's looking good. One of the things that we can do if we were trying to factor our code would be to make an OSPAY partial here, right? So then it turns that into a render partial collection. We've got our little partial here. We can go back and we can look. We can see it looks the same, right? So if we wanted to make these in the order that they were posted, you know, first at the top, one way to do that would be to just reverse that collection, right? That seems pretty easy, but I don't think that's as unmaintainable as I would like it to be. So let's do something else here. Let's get rid of these changes. Now, how can we unfactor this? This is back to its unfactored state or moderately unfactored state. One of the things we can do is we can change. Ruby has a lot of nice iterators. Right? This is a very nice iterator that we could use, but I don't want to use that. So let's use something else. <laughs> I 
It would be Oast Hayes, wouldn't it? Whoops. <laughs> so we can do that a couple times here. Should still look right. Oops. There we go. So now we're back to where we are. It looks the same, right? No, I'm not writing tests, uh, but that's okay. Uh, but it looks the same. No one can tell that we've made any changes, but I think this is uh, significantly harder to maintain now, right? Yeah? It's looking better, I think. I think it's looking good here. One of the things we can do, so what if we want to reverse this? How are we going to do that? How about this? Now here's one of the great things about this is because if you're not careful, when you unfactor, you can create weird things like off by one errors. So we have to add another <laughs> here. And no one's going to figure out, so now they're reversed. And it's, everything still works the same. We can add another post. You can see that it's going to come to the top of the list here. So we've unfactored our blog. Now, just think about coming back to this in six months, right? <laughs> or think about you're a new developer on the team, you've never seen this project before, you take a look at this code, or you're a consultant uh, that is brought in to do an audit. Your, your response is probably going to be, I don't know what this does, it, and it's terrible. But until that point happens, and usually we, we know that code audits very frequently happen outside of the, the company you work for, until that, until that happens, no one's going to want to touch this code with a 10-foot pole, which means that you will be able to continue working on it for as long as you want, and your job will be secure. Uh, so I think that is essentially all I have for unfactoring today. I'd love to take questions. Uh, the last time uh, we talked about unfactoring, there were some great suggestions. Uh, someone suggested a... Ruby to Ruby uh, library that would paralyze your Ruby code, or that would <laughs> that would uh, that was aware of, of Ruby keywords and such, and could uh, rewrite your entire library in Pig Latin for you, things like that. I'm working on something that adds complexity. Excellent. We should get together. Absolutely. I'd love, I'd love to do this print. Fantastic. We should have a little dialogue. I think that we could really work out some some wonderful tools for this. What's, what's the name of it? Uh, Transmogrify. Okay, I like a lot more. Can we go with something along those lines, maybe? I'm working on play right now. I'm doing the exact opposite of your talk. I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> cool name, though. <laughs> any, uh, any other questions for me, guys? Yes. Do you recommend using global variables? <laughs> Only if you put them in weird places. <laughs> if you forget to use their weird inheritance tricks to confuse people. <laughs> if two bags is good, why not four? <laughs> if two bags is good, why not four? How about 32 bangs? <laughs> and instead of using true, use bang bang question mark. Setting a, a, a loop variable, incrementing it, you know, there's a lot of opportunity left here. <laughs> I think, you, would, would you like to help me out here? We can refactor that right now. We've got some time. Uh, well, let's set some, some, some variable. Okay, so what we need, we need to start out with Fred or <laughs> Fred <laughs> equals zero, right? Yeah. So we can start with Fred equals zero. Then uh, you know, while forever. Yes, 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 so. While Fred less than. Now another opportunity for an off by one error here. I think that's correct. Good, good. 
us pays. But we're losing this beautiful code here. We're going to lose that. That's all right. Us pays Fred. Got it. Good. Now we have to remember, do we pre-increment or post-increment this, right? I'm sorry? Oh. Oh, we do need to keep that, don't we? Yes. Minus Fred. <laughs> Excellent. I'm sorry? One of the two sizes there should be lightning. Oh, and then this will be. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> That's better. It's better. Does it still work? We had, if we had tests, we'd know. Plus negative threat. Still works. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Uh, any other questions? Josh. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm a little surprised you haven't talked about the benefit to the performance of the application by doing this. Because obviously, if you do something like unrolling a loop, it creates a ton of more code that's harder to read, but it's also faster. <laughs> But Rails is a scale, so we're really, we're, we're, we're working toward, I mean, it's, it's a normal here. Uh, I think we had one back left. Uh, what if you explicitly checked for typed all variables? Explicit type checking. Yeah. And maybe have some caps. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you should have, like, explicit HTML in there, I would think. Like to. Mm, I do have, well, let's see, where can I fix that? I do have, uh, Maybe you should iterate over the columns. Oh, I could iterate over the columns. But no, but then if you change the column, it would just show up. That would be too easy. Good, it's a good idea, though. Uh, any other questions? Front, right, I saw. Uh, what's your stance on excessive use of the sand? What is my stance on the excessive use of ascent? So, for instance, what you're saying is we can do this, right? Oh. I don't do lists, but I don't know. One more. What are we at here? All right, hold on. They should be rainbow colored. Hmm. Yeah, that's too complex for me. I don't. I don't know. Um, it's a good plan, though. Any anyone else? Josh again. You're reaching your quota. Talk that wasn't crap. I'm sorry. Which was the one percent of your talk that wasn't crap? That was. <laughs> Middle right. If you have uh, three functions that you want to make available to a user uh, from an object, say from a web form or something like that, uh, would you use send to pass that command to the object? Well, what you can do is you can have a function, you can have a method that returns the name of another method. And then use send and then pass that method. <laughs> I got a couple here. Can we use that injection for the array pack there? <laughs> Yeah, you know, actually, I was hoping Janice would come up here and help me with this. You can really use the dependency injection to really just flesh out the unfactoring, I think. All right, another one. How do you recommend dealing with pesky coworkers that don't buy it? How do you even lose their jobs? How do you deal with pesky coworkers that don't buy into unfactoring? Unfactor their code? <laughs> Stella unfactoring? <laughs> Ninja unfactoring? Um, I don't know. It's not a problem I've had to deal with. I just work by myself. <laughs> I like to stay as far away from other people's code as I can. Really. Front Here's line. a really advanced idea. Ooh. Don't use methods of all, but instead have an array instance variable that's an array of props. And you can basically implement C++ virtual Have functions. you heard you look at the objects? <laughs> <laughs> have you, have you, no? Okay. I uh, got one here. Can we save ourselves from some effort by not writing any code in the controller? Like, just have the view talk to the database as a shortcut? You, you, you could do that. Um, 
can you save some effort by having the view talk directly to the database? Wouldn't that just make it easier to find the code? I mean, that's what PHP does, and that works out pretty well. Yeah, yeah, the helpers. Ah, helpers. And? Uh, you talked a lot about code, but what about file locations? Is it necessary to keep models in the models? What about file locations? This is uncharted territory here. We're opening up brave new ground. I like, no, I like this. This is good stuff. What about sim links to, you know, mount points on someone else's hard drive? I don't know. I'm just, you know, I don't know what's possible here. Any other questions? Front. If you unpack your test, can you make it so that you can understand what you're testing? I'm not giving you all my test directories, so it doesn't really matter. Um, I like to know that my tests work so I can continue unfactoring with, with relative abandon. Uh, but no one else ever sees my tests, so they don't, they don't know or care. Uh, yes? Uh, I noticed you neglected to generate some inline JavaScript make things really confusing. No, I, I didn't elect to do that. Ailes Ray elected to do that. <laughs> you can thank Ailes Ray for the inline JavaScript. Yes? What about evaling strings? Evaling strings. Well, there's, you know, a few different kinds of eval, so you can mix them up <laughs> and confuse people uh, which, which one you're using. We've, I've seen some pretty awesome uses of eval. There was a, uh, there's a Ruby... Um, XML playlist format parser that had, out of its few hundred lines, I think a hundred of them used eval. And they use eval for things like setting an instance variable. It was one of the most awesomely unfactored pieces of code I've ever seen in my life. It was fantastic. Probably no reason why you couldn't put the controller code directly into your model. Well, if you just pass back to the model, if you just pass the render template back to the model, everything can be done in the model, actually. That's true. Uh, well, we're not really talking about deployment, A, because Rails doesn't scale. And because we don't, we don't actually want the code to be slower to not run. We want it to run just fine. And we just want it to look like crap. Yes? Um, we all know that Ruby is slow, so we suggest shelling out to bash for some of these do, we suggest, do I suggest shelling out to bash or something else because Ruby is slow? Hmm. What about shelling out to C that's generated by Perl? <laughs> How about that? Yes? Uh, something I think that you're working here is being Are you wasting? <laughs> Actually, Fred would equal cheese here. <laughs> I believe. We can test this. Look at that. And you can do that for any number of college. Yes, you could. You could exhaust an entire dictionary of food related terms. Yes. Important enough writing that code. I have to rewrite it in terms of the three MERB enterprise components. Can we rewrite it with MERB? Uh, well, we can rewrite it for the enterprise. <laughs> yes. I like that, yes. Um, is there any benefit to using random uh, camel case and strange indentations, random indentations? I, I think you should randomly pick one for each line and then change <laughs> it the next line. Uh, I like really strange things like camel case with extra underscores randomly thrown into the words. <laughs> yes, I'll just go what right back. Taking the view 
it's then using ERB, using lots of string interpolation and, and then, you know, string addition and so on. To make you like Hamel? <laughs> Actually, we do use Hamel, but that's another talk. Um, yes? You haven't talked about helpers at all. Have you thought about inhibitors? <laughs> After this presentation, <laughs> it's had some yes. Can we some fun things with uh, operator um, overloading. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. Um, how about how about if we define oh I don't know let's say cow to be the square brackets. I think that's good. Is that better? Not cat now. No. I like cow though. I uh, saw in the red shirt in the back. I saw one. Uh, we override built ins to have side effects, so average equals calls a different method for different things. Yes. <laughs> you are all being uh, surprisingly inventive here. It's actually kind of scary. And the far back in the red shirt. I see your collection of OSI pays is uh, contains it, it's an array collection. Wouldn't it be safer for your career up with a controller you were to convert that or half with numbers as keys? Yes, it would. I also think that just having an array is too simple. We need a more complex data structure. Possibly we can define some sort of class that iterates over objects in a linked list of some kind. Josh? <laughs> Rebuke gracefully accepted. <laughs> yes. All right, this is a business question. How long do you wait before you quit to force them to hire you back as a consultant at W South? <laughs> you should probably talk to Obi about that one. <laughs> At every point you you call a method, at every point that we call a method, you should make sure that the object responds to it mm. before you call it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and secondly, I, I think we should exploit the use of raising errors as much as possible. I'm a big fan of raising errors and then catching them so that you can do a control flow. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I like that. Errors that are never thrown, just so when somebody reads the block, they'll have to look through to see what they possibly <laughs> 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 These are these are all excellent. Uh... No, that's that's good. You can use throw catch because I don't I don't think anyone knows how that works. <laughs> also, yes. How would you recommend uh, acknowledging a coworker's excellence in on factoring? I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, if you have a coworker who is truly uh, skilled at on factoring, how would you recommend recognizing that excellence? Merit badges. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Well, on the sash of some kind. <laughs> yes, in the back. So how do you think comments help? I'm sorry? How do you think comments will help? How would comments help? Why? 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 Why, Why would comments help? So how, how can you use comments to help this? How can we use comments to, to unfactor our code? I, I think if the comment has absolutely nothing to do with the code under the comment. Um, <laughs> this line will also track chains from length. So, Fuck. How the hell do those things end anyway? <laughs> don't remember anymore. Something like that. All right. I don't think that's the answer. Maybe it's easier for a COBOL programmer to maintain this. There we go. Um, yes. I don't think we have too much more time. So maybe just a few more questions. To a manager? I'm sorry. Is this going to make you run the risk to get promoted to a manager? <laughs> yeah, but then you don't have to do anything. 
<laughs> so that's really just win-win. Yes? I'm really surprised that you're actually using the built-in Ruby methods. Shouldn't we alias everything? I didn't have enough time. <laughs> I would have loved to. For instance, this you know should be. I just you know I only have so much time in a day to one factor. Uh, I think one more question. Yes. Would it help make you seem more like an architect if you know refactor all space to be a tree and then write an iterator, apply the visitor pattern, have it visit the tree mode by mode, and then print out the H2s and P's? I don't know what that question was, but I think the answer is yes. <laughs>